every morning I wake up and I get out of bed. I've also noticed that every morning the sun rises, which leads me to believe that because I get out of bed, the sun rises. Now, I'm, I'm going to guess some of you have also gotten out of bed today, so I'm going to share some credit. Because we got out of bed, the sun rose today. I'm being silly, of course. The sun rises because there's a celestial being that pulls the sun across the sky with the horses and chariots. We all know that. I mean, that's also ridiculous, right? However, for centuries, men and women and children lived and died believing that was exactly how the sun rose. So how do we know? How do we know what we know? That science is called epistemology. It's the study or a theory of the nature and grounds of knowledge, especially with reference to its limits and validity. How do we know what we know? I could be wrong, but I want to suggest right here at the beginning, as we've been talking through this particular stretch series, that we want to hold on to attention. When we're talking about how do we know what we know, we want to hold on to attention between faith and science. Now, while that isn't really an answer, I hear the beginnings of an answer in Scripture that we have, I want to lift up for us today. Psalm 111, just the second verse, just this one little piece of Scripture. We read, great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. And we say, thanks be to God. As a person of faith, the answer to most of my questions come, comes back to God. And here, the psalmist reminds me it's okay to ponder God. It's okay to ponder the answer. And when we're pondering, when we're, when we're asking questions, when we're thinking about God, where might we turn for deeper understanding? What, what source of information can we rely upon? Well, for centuries, even today, even as I begin sharing these words with you, the Bible has served as the primary source of authority. Sola Scriptura, we've been told. Scripture alone. It's no hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy, but it's where we are taught to turn with our questions about God, the universe, and everything. I have a problem with this approach, however. If I were just to stick with the question, how does the sun rise each morning? I find the Bible is not very helpful. Genesis, the beginning of our scriptures, tells us how God created everything, and it tells me that God spoke and the sun appeared. God set stars in their courses, and that's that. It's the divine equivalent of because I said so, which I don't find to be a very satisfying answer. It wasn't helpful um, to the people living during the late 1600s to the early 1800s either. They wanted better answers to the questions that they were asking about life, the universe, everything. They wanted better answers. And because there had been such advancement in, in that span of time in scientific understanding, it was to science that they turned. Now, it could likely be traced back to Aristotle, if not before. It's certainly present in Galileo. It became mainstream with Bacon and Newton and, and scores of others. What I refer to here is the scientific method. If you've been in seventh grade, eighth grade, somewhere in there, it seems like that's when I was introduced to the scientific method. You'll be familiar with, with what I'm talking about here. The exact steps vary, but, but generally we understand them kind of this way. You start with some observation, some, some fact about the world or something you, you think you're uh, seeing in the world. And then you might ask a question about it. I noticed that the sun rose today, and then I ask a question, why did it rise? How did it rise? Where did it come from, right? I start asking questions. I observe something, and then I ask a question about it. And then I begin perhaps forming an answer, a, a suggested way of understanding what I'm seeing, how I might answer the question. We call that a hypothesis. So observation, you ask a question, you come up with some idea about how you might answer the question. Then you got to test that idea. You, you make experiments the sun rose today, so I think it's because I got out of bed. 
Well, tomorrow I'm going to get out of bed and see if the sun rose. Yep, as a matter of fact, it did. Every time I get out of bed, the sun's in the sky. Check, check, check. What happens if I don't get out of bed? Right? I stay in bed. Oh, the sun rose today too? Hmm, that's odd. That's strange. Maybe uh, if I stay up all night, what would happen? I stay up all night. Oh, nope. Every single time, this doesn't appear that me getting out of bed is actually what's causing the sun to rise. So I test my hypothesis. I, I experiment, and then I begin to analyze what I've, okay, nope, doesn't look like me getting out of bed is, is the answer here. I create some kind of conclusion, which oftentimes leads us back to more observations. The process continues. To oversimplify the whole scientific method, the idea behind science, I think, in general, is this. Life is figureoutable, right? With enough questions, with enough data, with enough research, with enough resources and time, we can figure out anything. If you're pondering the works of the Lord, as the psalmist says, all you need to do is ask the right questions. Do enough research. Study enough information, and eventually you'll find the answers you're looking for. If you want to know about life, the universe, and everything, you could find a reasonable explanation if you just kept testing the science. The challenge for many is that searching for meaning scientifically did not lead toward God, but toward themselves, towards the individual. About the general flavor of the Enlightenment, William Bristow, writing in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, summarizes the Enlightenment this way, saying, Enlightenment philosophy tends to stand in tension with established religion, insofar as the release from self-incured immaturity in this age Daring to think for oneself, awakening one's intellectual powers, generally requires opposing the role of established religion in directing thought and action. In other words, we don't need priests and sacred texts to tell us what is real and how to live. We can figure it out on our own, thinking for ourselves. In this way, I wouldn't categorize that as a tension, as Bristow does, not a tension between science and religion, but as a collapsing of that tension. Instead of being stretched to allow both things to exist simultaneously, the Enlightenment said, snap, right? It's, it's intellect, it's reason, it's thought, it's the individual, self-imposed immaturity, right? <laughs> that we don't have to believe that some other force beyond us is in control. We can, we can understand anything we want to understand on our own. It's to abandon one form of authority, one source of authority, believing you found one that is superior. That idea, right, breaking the tension, not holding them together, I think, it, and, and, and collapsing it, thinking that you found a, a better way of understanding the world, I think it's helpful for us to wrestle with a little bit. I think it's helpful for us to consider. If Scripture is the primary way, I mean, as people of faith, I don't want, I don't want to assume anything about who you are or where you are, but let me just say in my own, my own understanding as a person of faith, Scripture is meant to be the primary way to know God. But maybe instead of throwing out the Bible and abandoning faith when we have questions about Scripture, we have questions about God that Scripture doesn't address well, maybe we need to examine what we think the Bible is and how it's meant to inform our faith. I, I want to affirm that the Bible is not a scientific textbook. It's not a science book at all. That's not to say that it doesn't include science. Contained in Scripture, you'll discover astronomy, mathematics, anatomy, biology, geography, engineering, psychology, sociology, as well as history, satire, poetry, music, and, and more. But the Bible is not trying to outline or explain astrophysics or quantum mechanics or provide a thorough understanding of time and space. That's not what this book is primarily concerned with. The problem for many is that we've been taught 
everything can be explained. And if this is our primary source of authority, this should help us explain the world. It should help us explain every question, right? answer every question we have. So we bring our scientific brains to reading scripture, and we're often left scratching our heads. Why no mention of dinosaurs? We see evidence of dinosaurs all over the place. It seems like there's a new dinosaur bone, dinosaur fossil record found every day, and and we're amazed by it. How come it's not mentioned here in Scripture? Seven days to create everything on earth? How does that make sense? How does evolution work then? We see evidence that when the environment changes, creatures adapt, creatures change. We adapt and change. Where's that in Scripture? If I count the years from Adam to Jesus, I get thousands, not millions or billions of years. But, but science has told us that's how old this planet is. That's how old the universe is. How do we reconcile these things? If we bring our scientific brains to the reading of Scripture, we say this is not very helpful. So many conclude, I can't be a thinking person and be a religious, faith-filled person. But if you bear with me for a moment, the Bible is not a science textbook. And, And perhaps you can also agree with me as I was taught in seminary, the questions we ask of Scripture will determine the answers we get. So instead of searching for scientific proof in the Bible, maybe what we need is a different approach when we ponder the works of God. Maybe instead of reducing the Bible to a textbook, and not a very good textbook at that, We can understand these pages are a love story meant to help us better understand why God creates, perhaps even more than how God created. I think if if we take that approach, if we hold this tension together, not only will this allow us to to see the tension exists between faith and science, but, but to understand it can be helpful. It might even lead to a humility that I believe we need perhaps more as we, as we learn more day by day. That we could recognize that even the greatest scientific minds of all time can't explain everything. That what we knew to be true one day is proven false somewhere in the future. How do, how do you make sense of, of what we know to be, be science? Light, for example, acts as both a wave and a particle. What? How, well, how does that work? How could it be both things? How could it do both things? I have no idea. Science can't tell us. Science can tell us that it acts as a wave, acts as a particle, but we don't know why. We don't know how. The earth is the center of the universe. Nope, it's the sun. Nope, wrong again. <laughs> right? If you just trace the history of, of our scientific understanding, we now have come to understand that We're on a planet spinning around a star we call the sun, which is spinning as part of a a galaxy, which itself is spinning around something in the middle of somewhere we're not even sure how to describe, which itself seems to be spinning through space and time in this grand universe. The more we know, the less we know, (laughs) right? How do we know? Maybe, maybe we can just understand there's, there are limits. That's epistemology, right? There are limits to the validity, the, 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 the extent of what we know. Maybe we could hold then these things together. We don't have to be dizzy spinning through space. Perhaps as Shakespeare's Hamlet says to his friend, perhaps would say to us, there are more things in earth and heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy, science. There are more things in heaven and earth than we could possibly explain. So let's not get upset about how little we truly understand. Let's not abandon our faith. Let's let's not reject our faith. But let it remind us that there there is much we still do not understand. There is much that is a mystery to us. Instead of clinging to our certainty, perhaps we could open open ourselves to a a continuing revelation. We read about an all-knowing God in Scripture, and I think we understand this God 
and God's work better when we, when we hold the tension together, when we, when we say that we, we, we can prove some things, but there's much we do not yet know. And so we're going to hold on to Scripture as the, as the place where we get to know God and, and get to understand life and the universe and everything. But we're going we're gonna to understand there are other sources of authority that we can, we can bring to bear to help us better understand God, better ponder the works of the Lord. In, in our faith tradition, the United Methodist Church, we hold what we call the Wesleyan quadrilateral up as a way of, 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 of being able to understand these questions. The, the idea here is that Scripture is primary. It is the primary way we, we come to know anything about anything. However, there are other sources of authority that, that help us better understand, perhaps even challenge what we encounter in our Bible. And, and those other sources of authority, quadrilateral, four, so there's four, Scripture primary, but there's also tradition, experience, and reason. And so we bring, bring this, we, you don't have to check your brain at the door. You don't have to check your brain at the computer screen. We can think, right? We, we can understand and ask questions, and it doesn't mean we throw out our faith. It means that we can have faith-seeking understanding. Science is an anti-faith. It's simply one of the ways that we've been gifted with, with a brain to, to make sense of, of our, our existence. Why, I think we're wired for that quest. We're wired to, to ask questions. Our curiosity drives us to find answers so again, in this way, I affirm the, the tension we want to hold between faith and science, that they, they can both help us answer our questions. So ask your questions. Search for the answers. Hold on to mystery. Know that there is a limit to what we know. There is much we will perhaps never know. So my hope this week is that, that, that maybe we could see these things come together. We could hold them together. I, I, I try, to, try to give us a little something we could work on, a way to practice this, I mean, just in our, in our day-to-day life. So my hope is that you'll watch a documentary and, and learn something about this planet. Or perhaps read an article or, or go to the library and, and do some research. Do some experiment with a, with, with a kid. Visit a planetarium. I, I learned that here in my hometown of Kansas City, one of the local universities, the University of Missouri, Kansas City, has telescopes that the public has access to. You can come and see these. You can come and, and take a look up, up, up into our universe, up into our sky with these high-powered telescopes. We, we've just opened a new aquarium here in Kansas City. So perhaps go to the zoo or go to an aquarium and, and ask questions and, and read and research and figure some things out. The, the point I try to make here is that we don't want to just get information. It, it's not just about learning facts or figures or, or data, right? It's not just about the science, but it's about how the, how the science can inform our faith, how these things can play together. If we're going to ponder the work of the Lord, God's creation, right, th- th- then perhaps we could ask some questions. So, so find some piece of science that is relevant to your life, that's interesting to you. Are you into gardening? Take a look at some horticultural website or you know, figure out something about seed propagation, or, right? You, you get what I'm trying to say here. Is if, if, if you've got some piece of your life you're interested in, there's a science that's connected to that. Ask some questions, dig in, and, and see how, how what you discover could help you better understand God could better understand the nature of our universe, that you might ponder the work of God and be drawn deeper into God's mystery. I pray that you'll find something that will pique your interest this day, this week, this life, and that as you ponder God, you will find God. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, you You created us, 
And I don't know all the hows behind that, but I know the why. Because you are love. Because you desired a relationship with us. And so, God, I just, I just thank you that you give us an opportunity to ask questions and make discoveries and chase our curiosities. God, would you show up in our answers? Would you make yourself known in this quest for knowledge? You know all things, and you know our desire to know all things. Will you, will you meet us in the tension between faith and science? Will you show us your love? I pray that you do. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I pray it. Amen.